Greetings fellow knights, it's myself Jonathan, also known as the PC Genie. Today we're going to be talking about mail armour, or as some of you call it, chain mail armour, whichever. I'll talk about, let's first talk about the two main types that there are, which are riveted mail and butted mail. There are some other more subtle differences that you can get in mail armour as well, and I'll discuss those in more detail as we go along. So first up, let's try on butted mail armour. So, in this case, it's basically consisting of, I'll give you a close-up now. Here we are. So, what you should have seen is that the butted rings are just very basic rings. They're, they have a split so that they can open up sideways, go into the pattern and then close sideways. And this is in a pattern that's called four in one. So for every ring that there is in a pattern, or at least in the middle of the pattern, there are four others on each corner. Simple as that. And they've got a sort of flow and pattern. So you should see almost like a sort of a left right, left, right as it sort of goes up and down and by that they all sort of combine together and it's sort of that scenario where the whole is better than the sum of its parts but in the case of butted mail it's not historically accurate unfortunately because for the amount of metal that's required which is pretty much almost identical to how much you'd need to make something like riveted mail it doesn't provide as much protection uh, Although there is a degree of sort of slash protection, those sorts of cut resistances and spreads force from impact slightly, especially if you've got things like um, maybe a gambeson or some thick padding underneath. But the problem is, because the way the rings are designed, because it is just a simple ring with the split in it that opens and closes easily, rather than using something like pliers to open and close them, something like the point of a sword or a spear uneven actually some impacts and cuts will actually pull the rings apart and will destroy the mail armor underneath so unfortunately as i actually showed in some tests i did against butted mail against all kinds of things swords axes it was an old series i did back when this was the only armor i had and it on most occasions showed that the armor was nearly useless against them unfortunately and this is the thing because it can put a, almost a bad sort of perspective and a bad light on mail armour itself so that people sometimes think that things like buttered mail and actually all mail in general is quite weak you know almost like you know the equivalent of tissue paper for armour but actually it's just the fact that this is poor quality unfortunately so let's have a look at something a lot more authentic shall we so we shall switch to riveted mail. So, in this case, it's a lot more authentic. Now, here, I'll give you a close-up. Uh, see if I can get the right angle. You might be able to see on quite a few of the rings, well, all of them, sorry, you should see what look like almost little blobs or dots. Those are rivets, and rather than something like butted mail, where you've just got it opening and closing on itself, it actually overlaps slightly, and there's a hole punched in the middle, and there's a rivet which secures it closed, which is significantly tougher. I'd say at least triple the strength, I'm not exaggerating, now it's probably more than that, but I'd say at least triple the strength of what you'd get in buttered mail. And it is something, if you look at the sort of artwork and, well, actual finds of medieval mail, they all show that it is riveted. And, uh, Admittedly, it takes a lot longer to put together and is a more expensive process. I certainly wouldn't want to spend all those hours putting this together ring by ring. I'm sure it's not exactly a riveting process. But, um, yeah, it is, like I say, it's a lot more resilient to cuts, more resilient to thrusts, and it's, it's still not great against impacts. You need to have a gambeson or an arming jack or something underneath, but against the sharp dangers of the battlefield, it's very effective. I mean, it can still have a bit of a weakness against thrusts, but it's not quite as bad as people imagine. Excuse me, there are examples of arrows and things like that being stopped 
at greater ranges, even though at sort of closer ranges, like our distance apart, something like a, a proper bow would indeed puncture through. It helps to a noticeable to degree at least, even if it's just helping reduce the amount of penetration from a spear or something. Um, beyond that, in both of the examples of shirts that you've seen so far, apart from the fact they're a bit loose-sleeved, uh, something tailored would be fitted a lot tighter to you, and thus be better, so you've not got this flopping about, but there you go. And they're also, well, this half-sleeved shirt is called a whore virgin, and that is, well, like I say, it's a half-sleeved shirt. They tend to be a bit shorter as well on the actual sort of skirt part that you could call it. And you get what's called a whore book, which is a full-sleeved version. And there are some examples which you see in medieval artwork again, and I don't know if there are any finds or such, but there you go. They actually can go so far that they actually extend into sort of fingered gloves or mittens all in one shirt. You see people in modern markets selling, you know, things like hauberks and separate mailed covered gloves and things like that. But actually, historically, it looks like they're all included as one piece together. Um, beyond that, I've also heard of what's called a, a Bernie. Now, people have made estimations on what it means, what sort of length it would be, like it's shorter than a whole virgin and that sort of thing, but haven't really found any evidence that shows it any particular way, so it's hard to say. But what we do know, at least, is that there's the whole book full sleeve and the whole virgin half sleeve. And if you look further back, you can sometimes see sort of vest versions that are completely sleeveless, but Usually you do have at least partial sleeves. Um, another thing that's worth noting is that although something like this is excellent under other armours, such as brigandine armour, maybe some kind of boiled leather sort of, you know, covering on your, uh, well, let's say a breastplate or something like that. And of course, like I say, it's great over armours, so over things like Gamberson's padded armour, maybe other things as well. You do see other interesting examples as well. Uh, under things like plate, when you start to look at full plate armour in the sort of 1400s and onwards, you start to see less sort of full shirts underneath the armour and more specific parts only covered by mail. I'll find a picture and pop it up on the screen somewhere, but um, you actually see what we today are calling voiders. So what they are is they cover specific areas, like say the armpits, and are normally sewn onto something like gamberson. And the idea is, they're designed to be worn under full plate armour, because although things like hard steel plates on full plate is of course stronger and is the better armour, it's rigid. So even when you look at the best armours, full plate armour, you know, your stereotypical knight in shining armour, you've still got the problem of, you've got areas like inside the elbow, in the armpits, cuff of the gauntlet, bits like that, even behind the knees and those sorts of areas, which aren't pro which you know you can't properly cover with plates because as you close in, say you're in your armpits or in your elbow, it's going to get caught and you won't be able to move anymore, which is bad if you want to have the maneuverability to fight. So what they do is with things like voiders, even in that later armour, mail still has its place and presence in that it covers those particular gaps with a not quite as tough, but still pretty decent and fully flexible armour. And that's one of the things that makes mail actually one of the longest serving armours in all of history. It's, it goes right from a good couple of hundred BC all the way up until basically the Renaissance, we're talking 1500s or so. And the reason being, although mail armour is quite heavy as an armour, it it's still, of course, very flexible, so it eliminates one of the core, most extreme problems you'll ever get in armours in history, which is, like I say, with the things like rigid steel plates, with other things like scale armour, lamellar armour, all the things you can think about, often they're too rigid and therefore they can only cover areas like the torso or the outside of the arms. So with mail, it means that it's been so popular because, despite the fact that it is a very it's obviously a metal armour that's very protective and very tough. 
it's still flexible enough that it can be worn under armors and it can be used to cover areas like the armpits. And as you can see, this shirt covers my armpits. There are very few other types of armor, except types of soft padded armor, that would ever do something like this. Normally, that's an exposed spot where someone could do something like what's called half sorting and stab me under there. So yeah, all in all, uh, male armor is quite underestimated. It's fantastic stuff. And uh, if you are ever going to do anything like reenactment or if you're just doing sparring in historical European martial arts or whatever, I'd strongly recommend getting male armor and in riveted form. Now, just as a final note, uh, I was mentioning about some other types of variants there are. Uh, sometimes you've got stuff like this, I'll show you again. These are in uh, round rings. But you can also get what almost a bit like washers, so you get flat rings. Those add more deflection and are harder to separate apart, they're even tougher still. And beyond that, there's also sort of sizes of rings. So obviously larger rings will require less time to put together because you're, you know, individually putting rings together, they're going to be a heck of a lot less to put together. But with larger gaps, it means that the force is being focused on the singular rings rather than across the shirt. And also, you might end up with gaps where certain fine points on weapons can end up going through anyway sufficiently. So, on more expensive and tougher types of armour, like I say, you tend to see flattened rings, you also tend to see more smaller rings, which therefore allows for a much better coverage in terms of between each ring, and also is actually t sometimes lighter because they can be a bit thinner and smaller because they're compact. So yeah, it's, it's worth shopping about. There's certainly plenty of variants. It's not a basic armour. This is chainmail. This is another chainmail. There's a lot of variance in personality between them, but overall, like I say, there was no European button mail. It was all riveted. And uh, there was a fair bit of variance in between. So yeah, that's what I have to say about mail armour. I'm sure there are other things that can be mentioned. Like I say, it actually can end up being a very broad topic, but I'll leave it at that for now. And see you in the next video. Cheers.